So this thing about black people and black people of a certain age um, not being interested in, in cryptocurrency um, is a fallacy and it would be um, stereotyping at its worst because, um, I mean, I was into blockchain and Bitcoin even before you were. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Foster Inclusion Podcast, and thank you so much for joining me. I'm your host, Saida Gomez Fleury. In this episode, I have a very special guest. My pops. Yep, my dad is sitting in on this episode. Well, he's dad to me, but for his former students, he's Mr. Gomez. Professionally, he's known as Henry Gomez, and artistically, he's known as King Cosmos. I invited him on after receiving feedback from my previous episode, Bitcoin Wisdom for Busy People with Ashley Chen. A few of you who are unfamiliar with Bitcoin found the episode to be pretty insightful. And a few of you gave me feedback saying that Bitcoin does not foster inclusion because it's not accessible to quote unquote minorities and older people may not get it. I figure my dad, a baby boomer in his 70s and a quote unquote minority would be a good person to talk to in this instance. My father has accomplished a lot in his life. Born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago, he took a chance on himself by leaving Trinidad at the age of 23 and moving to Toronto, Canada to start a new life from scratch. He led a highly successful career as a teacher, recorded and released multiple albums. He is a Calypso monarch, a trained actor, And most recently, he completed his second master's degree in interdisciplinary studies from York University. In this episode, Dad talks about lifelong learning, how he manages negative stereotypes, multiculturalism in Trinidad and Tobago versus Canada, and so much more. He also politely reminds me that he was into Bitcoin way before I was. Just one thing, before we get to the episode, I'd like to warn you that in sharing some of his experiences, dad uses racial epithets. If you are triggered by these words, or if kids are listening, this may not be the episode for you. So, Dad, thank you so much for agreeing to be on my podcast. Saida, so I'm delighted to be here to uh, to be doing this podcast with you. Thank you. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. I'm very excited, as uh, my voice would let you know. Very, very <laughs> excited to be doing this. You know, I thought of you because um, I keep hearing that age and whether a person is quote unquote a minority are barriers to adapting to new technology. And so like specifically after my last podcast episode, Bitcoin Wisdom for Busy People with Ashley Chen, um, I received a few comments because I had said that Bitcoin helps to foster inclusion. And um, those comments were sort of along the lines of, minorities or older people won't be able to adapt. And I kind of sense that there was sort of maybe veiled stereotypes in those comments. So I thought of you and I thought it would be a great experience for my listeners to have you come on and share a bit of your experiences with everyone. And basically just to um, maybe help to dispel certain myths. So can you tell everyone who you are, how you came to be Henry Gomez, AKA King Cosmos? Well, where should I begin? It it could be a very, very long story, a very entertaining story full of twists and turns. So let's say I begin at the present, Henry Gomez, AKA King Cosmos, retired educator, among other things, I would say historian, uh, geopolitical buff. I am interested in all aspects of life. 
so that um, my, my knowledge base is very, very wide and in some cases very deep as well. Uh, as a retired educator, I still believed in lifelong learning, so I went back to university, York University in Toronto. And um, as a matter of fact, um, convocation will be this month, so I completed my second master's degree. This one in interdisciplinary studies. Prior, my previous master's was in uh, theater, a master of fine arts. And as an educator, I taught media studies, drama, and uh, English literature. Jump back many, many years. I was born in Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, TNT, sweet TNT. So I'm a Trinidad <laughs> born, as the song says. The land of steel, ba steel pan, limbo, carnival, masquerade. You name it, uh, the land of fat, as David Rudder says. Fat. Uh, welcome to the land of fat. So um, I migrated to Toronto, Canada when I was, I think, 23 years old. Oh, wow. So essentially, I grew up in, in uh, TNT. But I like to tell people that, um, so when I think about my age, I think I was, I had a rebirth when I migrated to Toronto, Canada. Because yes. Culture shock, I mean, took its toll on me. So for quite a while, it was a matter of uh, finding myself, yeah. uh, de dealing with um, identity. I, I, I think I experienced identity crises, but I dealt with them in, you know, in my own way. Because you know that I'm fiercely independent. I believe in solving my own problems. And I think one of my strengths and weaknesses is that very often I don't call for help when I should call for help. Yeah. I um I muddle through, I figure things out, and I seek help, but sometimes not obviously. So I observe other people, I observe other other situations, I pick up bits and pieces of information from those situations. I am um, you know that I I I am uh what is, what what is it I shouldn't say a believer in I love mythology. Yeah. And you know, you know that through through many conversations you know that mythology has um has been a a guiding force in my life because um I look at mythology as a means of um of figuring life out. Yeah. You know by by looking at the stories they tell, looking at the characters, the role they play, the roles they play. So uh you have that uh, I'm also an actor, I've been a, a profession professional actor for many years, theater, stage, television, film, you name it. Uh, I've done that for many years, I still am. I'm a composer and recorded recording artist, hence my name, King Cosmos, which is um the name that uh, I gave myself and people accepted uh, after I won the Canadian Calypso Monarch competition in uh, 1995, many many moons oh, wow. ago. Wow! So I've, I've led a I would say a complex life, um, taking many detours. The mainstay, I think, of my life in Canada has been as an educator because that's, uh, 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 that allowed me to learn so much because um, I always believe that even though I was, uh, quote-unquote, an educator, I was a student at all times because I learned a lot from my students. Yeah. So I was I really teaching or was I really learning? I uh, I don't know. I'm I'm still learning because yeah. um, I believe that um I I do believe in the saying that um one's life is always you know in 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 process. Um, it's always that is if one chooses to learn. There are some people who press the stop button. And they don't even know it. They they function, and I mean to each his own. I'm not criticizing those people, to each his own. But they press the stop button at some point, and um, you know they they stop really experiencing. I don't believe in that. I think that uh, for as long as we're alive, we we should continue to be a work in progress. So that's how I see my life. 
And um, I, I don't know if there's anything else I should add at this point. Well, you've added a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot. There's so many areas that we can dive into, and we will. Uh, probably um, uh, as the conversation progresses, I'll probably come back to certain things. Um, so you mentioned that uh, Trinidad is the land of Fet, as David Rudder, a very famous uh, Trini Calypsonian, would, would say. Um, Trinidad is also quite multicultural. Many people, many of my listeners are not familiar with uh, Trinidad or its multiculturalism. Can you touch a little upon that? Oh, certainly. Uh, Trinidad, I think in many ways, invented multiculturalism. Uh, before the term was coined in academia or by politicians, we lived a, a, a multicultural life because we, over the years of uh, colonialization, uh, we've had the Spanish. Well, let's begin with the, the Amerindian people who lived there, the, the Caribs and the Arawaks mainly. Yeah. Uh, the Spanish, we've had the British, we've had the French. Those were the main colonizing powers. And, but within that, we've had people from all parts of the world. Uh, so Portuguese, Italians, well, all Europeans, I think, uh, set down roots in Trinidad and Tobago at some point. But we've had people from the Middle East, uh, Syrians, Jews, Palestinians, um, we have people from the African continent. Well, you know, with the advent of slavery, yeah. I think the, the first set of uh, enslaved Africans arrived in Trinidad around 1605 or somewhere around there. Then we had East Indians um, who were brought in by the British as in uh, what, what indentured laborers. Uh, we've had the Irish. We so. We've been mixing and matching. We've had the flotsam and the jetsam showing up in the shores of Trinidad and Tobago for many, for hundreds of years. So we lived a multicultural life. Uh, the two main ethnic groups in Trinidad and Tobago are the Africans and the East Indians. But uh, within, among those, or together with those, we, we, we have many, many, many ethnic groups. And I think this is the reason that um, when one looks at the, the, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, one sees this wide variety uh, reflected in their, their ethnic uh, makeup. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, for instance, in our family, uh, your mom has told you on many occasions that um, uh, for instance, you, you're a combination of um, African, Indian, Scottish, you know, you name it. Um, that's not unusual for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I got to tell you this joke. It might sound a bit uh, crude, so I'll say it in as polite a, a manner as possible. But um, so I got to go beyond the, the father and daughter thing. We are two people having a podcast. Okay. So now I heard this from... Uh, Jean Paul, who is one of the, uh, uh, he's a Canadian stand-up comic, and he said, "Well, you know, I am from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm a Trini, you know, and um, it's one thing about Trinidad and Tobago. You go to Trinidad and Tobago, it, it, you know, people look at me and they think, well, I could be Indian, I could be, you know, um, uh, Arab, I could be, I could be anything, you know. What, what's my ethnic background?" And he says, one of the reasons for that is that in Trinidad, and Tobago, what, he says, what, what does that tell you about the people of Trinidad and Tobago? What does that tell you about Trinidad and Tobago? And there was a pause. Well, of course, people couldn't answer. And he said, look, it tells you that we F anybody. Oh, you know? dear. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the, this, and, this podcast is actually rated for even kids. So it's clean. Yeah. Uh, it, it was his way. In other words, we like to mix with everyone. It, it, it's the, right. okay. yeah, it's the right. mixture. And it's funny right. because, um, um, especially here living in Switzerland or when I lived in France, people often look at my name or they see me and they say, where are you from? Like, what, what is all of this? 
And my only explanation is, well, up until till a certain point, my explanation was Trinidad and Tobago. But then I had the opportunity to travel to uh, Mauritius, Lille Maurice. And yes. the, uh, the mixture of people is very similar to the mixture that we see in Trinidad. And they actually have tamarind balls as well. So I was like, oh, great. Like, wow. <laughs> I found a home on the other side of the planet. Very nice. Well, a great icebreaker to deal with that when people ask you where you're from, I'm suggesting you may not feel comfortable using it. For, I still do it. People are like, where are you from? And then I, from my mother's womb. And then yeah. I begin laughing, and they laugh too, and then the conversation begins. Yeah. <laughs> there are so many ways to approach it. And for me, everything is about context, it's about tone, right. it's about, you know, there's so many ways. But I'd like to know from your perspective how multiculturalism in Trinidad and Tobago compares to multiculturalism in. I would say Canada, but more specifically Toronto or Toronto for people yeah. not from the region. <laughs> Toronto, 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 Toronto. <laughs> yes. Um, number one, Trinidad and Tobago is much smaller in population, in yeah. size, geographical size. Uh, the ethnic diversity uh, might not be as great as um, Toronto's right now. But. Um, because we are smaller and we are piled up one and the other, I think um, it, it is much easier for people to, to interact on a fairly intimate basis. Toronto is so formal. You know, everything has to be institutionalized before yeah. it could be lived. And I, I think see. in Trinidad and Tobago, everything is lived, sometimes not even institutionalized. So people negotiate more on a one-on-one -on -one basis as, a, as opposed to an institutionalized or official basis. That's the best way I could describe it. Uh, you know, we have to have laws passed before certain things could be done, could be enacted. And um, so that makes it, in my opinion, stiff and cumbersome. Yeah, you know, in Toronto it, 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 or in Canada. It, 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 that's right. It, it takes away uh, the, the agency from people to negotiate one-on-one -on -one as they go through life. Uh, th that, to me, is the major difference between multiculturalism in Trinidad and Tobago and multiculturalism in Toronto, Canada. So then it's not necessarily... The difference is not necessarily in the mix of people or... The, the, the makeup of the population, it's more in the way people go about things. Lived, uh, yes. yeah, okay, I see. I, yeah, that's, that's how I would put it, because um, here, you know, even though we talk about multiculturalism, um, to me, the only thing really multicultural about uh, Toronto is Caribana, because people get involved and they really negotiate pretty much one on one. They they, they really mix it up. Yeah. Uh, if, if if one looks at the city of Toronto, which which is something I do on a regular basis, I get on the subway, and it's one of the reasons I like using public transit, because as I get to certain areas of the city, I can tell where I am by the ethnic makeup of the people I see getting on and getting off um, public transit. Yeah. So, yes, we have multiculturalism, but people are still, for the main part, isolated in their residential groupings. You know, if, if okay, years ago on the Danforth, it, it was, quote-unquote, the Greek community. Yeah. So when there's a taste of the Danforth, you travel along the Danforth between, let's say, um, a little east of Broadview right down to Jones, you find that that's Greek town. I am, you go to the West End, let's say you're around, um, from around Manning to about Shaw, that's the Italian, and then west of that it's the Portuguese. You have Chinatown, uh, well you have various Chinatowns in Toronto. Um, you go up to Steeles and Kennedy, you have the Pacific Mall. So you go to certain areas and you see that there are these pockets. 
that it that doesn't ex it doesn't exist to that extent in Trinidad and Tobago. I see. It's fascinating because um, you know there's there's our in at business school we looked a lot um, along the leadership stream at our internal and external journeys. Um, yes. observation, observe, observing, sorry, the world around us and paying attention to our own choices and our own reflections. And it's fascinating because listening to you describe, um, the differences between Toronto and Trinidad, and then saying that Toronto has a lot of pockets. It makes me think of my childhood, you know, when you and mom were raising Tash and I, when we were young and your choice to not live in a pocket. Yes, because we were the only yes. black family in our building, you know, um, I think this I can say the same for Tash. She's six years older than me, but I was only the I was always the only black little girl in all of my classes. And so what prompted you and mom to not live in a pocket and to live elsewhere? I am not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We did it, and um, now that you're talking about it, we we never looked at it that way. We, uh -huh. um, well, let's say we went with the flow to some extent because we began, let's say, around 1971, 72, when I was still a drama student at uh, Ryerson Polytechnical. It was Ryerson Polytechnical Institute at the time. Later, it became Ryerson University, and um, as a, as a, uh, to digress a bit, uh, recently we see what has happened with Edgerton Ryerson's statue. It's been pulled down, but that's another discussion. Um, mm. So, yes, 1972-73, when I was at Ryerson, I was a student. Um, your mom had newly come to Canada from, uh, from England, and... Um, we were living in the West End. Uh, we were around Oakwood and St. Clair, which was a, a very, it had a considerable Caribbean, quote unquote, black population. We were living there, and then um, because of uh, our pecuniary status at the time, we decided to um, appeal for, at the time it was called, I think, Ontario Housing or Metro Housing, I can't remember. Um, so we applied for that um, it was housing geared to income. That's how it was termed at the time. Okay. And uh, we applied. We were our application was accepted, and we were assigned or sent to this address in Scarborough. We didn't Scarborough. know where the hell we were going. <laughs> yeah. because, um, I, up to that time, I I had never been to Scarborough. I knew downtown Toronto. And Scarborough used to be referred to as Scarberia. Scarberia. Because, I actually uh, remember that term. Uh, 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 yes, because it was. It seemed so remote. Uh, the transit system was not as developed and um, as extensive as it is now. So um, we simply said, okay, that's where we're going. Uh, 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 we had Natasha at the time. And so that's how we ended up in Scarborough. And um, But our approach always was of our current situation is not our final destination yeah so yes we were there but we always knew that that wasn't the end that that that's not where we were going to remain we were going to use that as an opportunity to uh get a get a get our footing because we're still suffering culture shock you know get our footing decide where we'll go, how we'll develop ourselves. And since it's been drummed into our heads from the even before we were born, that education is the key. You know, our parents used to say, get an education, get an education, get an education, because it's the one thing no one can take away from you. Yeah. Once you've got an education, no one can take it away. And that's your passport to success. So that stayed with us all along. And so we, um, you know, we use that as a, as a grounding. And then even though, yes, we had children and so on, you and Natasha, 
we decided that we were going to go back to school. We would continue our education. Uh, your mom was a trained nurse in England. Uh, and so we made the sacrifice. So, so it wasn't about living in a in an area with people who actually looked like you. It was really about making choices in order to advance. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, yes. So th that's why we ended up where we were. And we, yes, we were aware of it, but um, it never really got it to It wasn't us. important. Um, no, so it, this it idea important. of diversity and inclusion today, I'm not sure uh, what which level of exposure you've had um, with respect to diversity and inclusion in organizations or at work, because it may not have been as popular while you were still teaching. But from what you've seen or what you've heard, what is your, how, how do you feel about it? Because you and mom made choices based on, basically for strategic reasons. Did skin color or background or did any of those things factor into the way you made choices? I don't think so. And uh, I say that because I was never conscious of making choices because of uh, skin color or background. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think I could say the same for your mom. We made choices based on, as you say, for strategic purposes, we wanted to accomplish certain things. So the desire to accomplish and to succeed determine the choices we made yeah so okay for instance i wanted to become a trained actor i chose to um chose not to pursue becoming an electronic technologist and going into a drama program instead you know so that was a strategic choice it so happened that i was the only black person the only person of african ancestry in the theater program at ryerson uh, the, the program began, began in 1971, and uh, I don't think that that was necessarily because of discrimination or anything like that. It's just that there are very few people of African ancestry being aware of the program and applying, um, you know, to, to enter the program. So in its first year, there was uh, one black uh, student, his name Philip Aiken, um, he later beca became a very prominent uh, director of a theatre company here in Toronto. Uh, the second year, I was the only one, and I think the third year, um, Marvin Ishmael, a fellow Trini, he was the, the only one as well. So uh, I was conscious of that. It, it was very uncomfortable at times, but, um, you know, uh, in, my, in my own way, my modes of survival and my methods of survival, I used uh, humor, I used whatever it took to survive that. It was quite painful at times, but hey, you know, b being born is painful. So, yeah, you know. Uh, especially for the mother, as a woman who recently <laughs> had a baby. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, of course, I would never know that. <laughs> but, I'm joking. But, but I imagine it is for the child coming through yeah. the canal as well. You know, but um, yeah, so, you know, life is painful at times, but it's still beautiful. So um, what types of stereotypes or what sort of images or constructs did you have about Canada before moving? And how did those stereotypes stack up to reality? Wow, great, great, great question. You gave me, well, you got me. I, I have to reminisce. Uh, Okay, so let me begin by thanking my teachers. Uh, now, in, in retrospect, I think we had teachers who were geniuses. Uh, we had teachers who saw, their, saw teaching as a calling, not as a job, as a calling. Um, and I think I incorporated some of that same mindset into my career as a teacher as well. But now, going back to our teachers, they did not have the, the accessories, the tools, the resources that teachers have today, yet they did an amazing job at preparing us for a life beyond Trinidad and Tobago. So my case in point, 
uh, geography was one of the, the physical geography, regional geography was one of the subjects we had to take at school. And um, in that, we had to know about the entire planet. This is no exaggeration, the entire planet. All the continents, the oceans, the seas, the major lakes of the world. And uh, one of the countries that we learned a lot about was Canada. You know, uh, the, the, the provinces, you know, the, who was the prime minister at the time, it, it, so many things, because Canada was part of the British Commonwealth, well, it still is part of the British Commonwealth, so was Trinidad and Tobago. We had to learn a lot about Canada. And one of the, the, the features I remember being taught about Canada was the formation of Oxbow Lakes. Now, this is at a time when I never even dreamed of traveling to Canada. But lo and behold, years later, uh, when I became an actor and uh, when I had my first acting, professional acting gig that took me to Saskatchewan, I traveled to Saskatchewan by airplane. And it so happens it was daytime. And as we got over the prairies, there I could see below oxbow lakes and i thought my god you know it, it was like my gosh i'm getting goosebumps now that i'm telling you this story because it was as though i was prepared in school for that moment that's when the lesson about oxbow lakes made sense in in, in a tangible way also I could look out and see the fields. Now we learned about wheat coming from the prairies and so on. And I could see the fields laid out, you know, almost like a quilt blanket, patchwork. And yeah. I, 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 one of my, not one of my favorite seat on a plane is at the window. I, I would do anything to get a window seat because I love looking out and seeing the landscape and wow, it was, I became a little child again, you know, so there I was, it was, oh my gosh, so this is what an Oxbow, Oxbow Lake looks like. Now, we had to look at the maps and draw these things, you know, on paper and what, but that was nothing compared to seeing the real thing. So, that's by way of illustrating how that 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 kind of preparation at school yeah e equipped me now to understand something more about the country uh that i adopted as my home that that that's one example but okay. did you like when um in terms of so geography um or other academic subjects you were prepared in that sense and on an interpersonal level um, did you find that your your teachers and your educators equipped you with uh, with that thing to navigate certain interpersonal um, uh, situations or relationships that perhaps you weren't accustomed to before moving to Canada? That was more of a challenge. So here now, uh, philosophical approaches to life become important. For instance do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, having respect for people, especially one's elders. Now, uh, uh, that had me confused for a long, long time, and I'll explain uh, later on. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, there existed, and still exists, this kind of, um, quote-unquote, respect for your elders. So. Speaking to people on a first name basis is to a great extent still a kind of um, a, a no-no, especially if the person is much elder, you know, is Mr., Mrs. or Miss, and especially in, in the workplace. So that had, uh, boy, that, that was so ingrained that at times it made me seem to be anti-social in the Toronto setting. 
Oh, wow. Because in this setting, it's a first name basis. So putting Mr. or Mrs. or Miss in front of someone's name is, was a way and still is a way of distancing, you know, setting up a, a distance between oneself and that person. And um, in some cases, it, it, it might even be considered as being rude or being insultive, mm -hmm. you see. And I remember uh, when I was still a student at George Brown College, I worked um, as, a, as a short order cook, um, bus boy, kitchen help, you name it. At, um, at that time, there was a chain of restaurants called Zum Burger. Is that and what I remember. Yeah, Zumberger. I remember uh, I had a, a supervisor whose name was um, Mr. Mr. Newman. And uh, now being respectful and being, you know, well-trained, even though I was rebellious at times, uh, I continued to address him as Mr. Newman. And I remember him saying to me one night, and I, oh, I even called him sir at times, and he said to me, the less the sir, the more the brotherhood. You know, the what, say the that sir, again? The, the less the sir, the more the brotherhood. Oh, wow. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I heard it, it registered, but it puzzled me for a while. I thought, what, what, what does this mean? It's the first time I'd heard that expression. And uh, I, but I continued, yes, sir. And, you know, because again, I was being respectful. I thought I was being... And he now didn't look at it that way, you know. It, it, so in his way, he was saying to me, "Look, cut the crap about so and so and so." You know, my name is. And it took me a while to figure that out. The less the sir, the more the brotherhood. So, going back to your question about being prepared now to interact on a one-on-one -on -one basis with with people, that was a difficulty because. Whenever I got into a situation in which, let's say, someone was quote unquote uh, in 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 a um, uh, senior capacity in the workplace, I addressed the person as Mister or Sir, and that happened even when I became a uh, secondary school teacher. You know, other teachers were addressing the the principal by first name, and I kept saying Mister whomever the principal happened to be. It took me many years to become comfortable addressing someone in a position of authority by his or her first name. So here's you know? a question then. Um, yes. Because you mentioned um, when addressing your elders, for example, and you also mentioned someone in a position of authority in the workplace. So what right. happens if uh, there is a person in a position of authority by title, by rank in your organization, but is perhaps 20 or 30 years younger than you? Would you still say miss or missus or how, how would that work? Well, now it's a first name basis because uh, I've become acclimatized to that. You see, but at that time, it would have been Mr. Mrs. Miss, whatever, um, you know, was the, the protocol at the time. That, that's, that's what it would have been. Because um, that's, the, that's the training I received. That was the um, foundation on, on which I built later on, but which I removed as time went by. But it still happens in Trinidad and Tobago today. Let me tell you this story. Um, not long ago, uh, let's say, no, year before, uh, I had occasion to go to the consulate. Uh, there was a function at the Trinidad and Tobago consulate. And uh, I met a, several of the, the staff members um, to whom I spoke. Some of them knew me prior. Uh, but there was a change in staff, and there was a gentleman there who would recently been appointed. Um, and I'm in the habit of asking people their names you know, in the course of a conversation, well, what's your name? Well, my name, and we, so we talk. When I asked him his name, he told me that his name was Mr. Sonsa. And right away, it threw me back to that experience. The less oh, the wow. sir, the more the brotherhood, because Mr. has the implications of sir. Yeah. Okay, behind it. And right away, I said, hold on, wait, 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 wait. What's your name? 
but Mr. Z, I said, no, no, no. And I, I said, no, okay, I'll call you, your name is, okay, my name is Henry Gomez, also known as King Cosmos, okay, no Mr. And he kind of looked at me, but then I realized that that's how he was trained. Yeah. You see, you see, so, and I'm talking about, I think about two years ago, no more than three years ago, that's the way, so it still exists in Trinidad and Tobago, especially in, in government offices and so on. Yeah. You know, it's, so, so this is why I believe in, in one-on-one -on -one negotiations as we go along. Yeah. Okay, another story, um, okay, complaints about sexual harassment in, in the workplace or in, in any office setting or among people, those complaints are quite common. So now, uh, in my during my um, interdisciplinary studies um, over the last few years, okay, the head of the program, all right, um, we we seemed like kindred spirits, all right. So now, I am I'm very how should I put it? it I am a, a kinetic type of person, you know. I'm a huggy type of person, and so on. But in the climate in which we live, I keep all those things under check. And now, lo and behold, <laughs> one day, um, go to the office, and there she is. It's a female. And I, I, even though she's, well, yeah, she has told me she's a lesbian because she's told me about her female partner and so on. And the director of the program, oh, Henry, so good to see you. And her arms were wide open and she embraced me. And I must confess that as liberal and as free as I am, it took me by surprise. But I reciprocated. You, you know, I, I wasn't in such a state of shock that I shoved her away or pulled her away. On. I reciprocated. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is, again, one has to be prepared for such things. And mm -hmm. um, it, now, I would never have made that first move. Yeah, you, you, you see yeah. what I'm getting at, because the man is always in that awkward position, you see. Um, but now, as she did it, and not only that, she's the director of the program. So you have many, you know, the dynamics involved in that one gesture, and the potential for things to go any which way are so great. That, um, yeah, that is one. a tricky uh, area to navigate because, exactly. um, yes. and as you say, it's the one-on-one -on -one negotiation that's very important. All um, the time. And in addition to that, I would sort of I advise people to err on the side of you know keep your hands to yourself <laughs> yes, <laughs> because totally agree. it takes time to understand and to fully like develop communication between people so that you are sure that you're interpreting actions properly and you know within an academic space or with a, or at the office it's better not to be too touchy-feely because that can lead to other issues and um and i i really like i really like what you said and i'll repeat it the one-on-one -on -one negotiation is important because um, I find that um, with the executives I consult, there are topics that cause them, males in particular, to roll their eyes because they feel as though society has gone too far in terms of, uh, they would say, political or PC culture. And I understand why measures have been taken in order to limit you know, instances of sexual um, harassment in the office, etc. And at the same time, it does kind of take away that spontaneity and the ability for people to bond. So I like what you say, one-on-one -on -one negotiation and read the room, basically. All the time. It, it's, um, and I agree with you, it's better to err on the side of caution. Uh, because as we have seen from time to time, these things have um, serious ramifications yeah. in, in, in the workplace. It could affect one's advancement. I, I predict that as, um, as time goes by and women become 
you know, it becomes more commonplace for more women to be in senior positions and so on. You'll have the same thing happening. Women accusing other women, men accusing women of um, sexual uh, in, um, inappropriateness in, in, in the workplace because it's a human thing. It's um, Now, we get into an area in which, you know, we we consider whether there are really differences between men and women, between male and female, or be, among all the genders you can think of, or all the sexes you can think of, however one wants to approach them. But uh, whether it's nurture or nature, there are differences. Um, with, with an awareness of these differences is causing um, society to 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 bring in different rules different measures and so on in order to make the to make life as um easily navigable as possible mm -hmm. you, you, you know and and i think it's necessary because for a long time it's been a paternal i am um, environment for a long time men have had license not have had have taken the license to treat people, even other men, as they, to be abusive, to be outright abusive. So it's of necessity that these things have come into place. But uh, I don't think that people should ever allow this to prevent them from having a degree of spontaneity, from, from enjoying life, from in, enjoying being in the company of their fellow human beings. And sometimes it's a matter of common sense. You, you know, um, and simply, again, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. Yep, definitely. And um, you've often said to me it's about ideology. Yes. Um, and I've, I've, I think of that statement frequently because Right now, with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion, there are shortcuts that are taken in that we look at people or we want to hire people because of their skin color or because of, of their uh, gender expression or gender identity, etc. And, um, and there, there is a chance that at times we may forget that we do also have to consider the person's mindset in addition to uh, their physical characteristics. And I'd like to know how you came to that, that conclusion by yourself, to consider someone's thoughts, to consider the way a person behaves, as opposed to only judging them based on their appearances. Well, even though I, I'm not, I can't say Precisely how I came upon that, um, let's say, that, that uh, approach to life or that guiding principle. Uh, but I believe that um, I arrived at it after examining, um, let's say, the, 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 the scope of history over thousands of years and um, even examining contemporary or fairly contemporary happenings. And um, I, I often think of what unites people, yeah. what, what sets people apart. I often think of what are, the, what are some of the enduring principles of life, regardless of technological advancements, regardless of... Um, geography, regardless of ethnic origin, regardless of religion, you name it. What are some of the uh, principles of life that, uh, that have been with us and that will continue to be with us and that are re really um, undeniable and that can be supported by empirical evidence? So it's by examining all of that I concluded that uh, it is ideology that causes people to to bond over um, any any uh, whether it's a project, whether it's um, uh, more important things uh, to commit atrocities or mm -hmm. to 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 do good deeds. It's a matter yeah. of ideology, 
And um, combined with ideology, one would have, um, or one has self-preservation. And by self-preservation, I mean preservation of the individual self, then by extension, preservation of the, the family unit, then by extension, preservation of uh, the tribe, the town, the village, the, the city, the country, etc., etc. So in in so on a theoretical level, uh, you've you've made observations, you've studied, you've reached this conclusion. How do you actually operationalize that in your daily interactions with people? So, for example, if someone says something to you that hints at um, a stereotype or something, how do you actually manage that on a daily basis? Or do you even recognize that someone could be projecting a stereotype at you? Well, it all depends on the situation. So in that sense, I may become um, a situationalist. And um, I evaluate, is it worth my time to begin with? Is it yeah. worth my energy to, to make this an issue? Because not everything is... As serious as we tend to make it at times you, you know there's oh, a saying yep. about making a molehill into a mountain or making a mountain out of a molehill and one has to assess these things it will differ from person to person yeah because w what what's important to another person might not be important to me and here is where again negotiations come in and um, taking the time and energy to understand where someone else is coming from. So I, I, let's say I put something on a scale of zero to 10. I say zero because it might not, simply might not be worth it. Yeah. So on a scale of zero to 10, do I bother with this, do I not? I have encountered um, situations of racism. I've been called a nigger, even by police officers here in Toronto. And oh, wow. at times I've taken it on, and at times I laughed. You know, and I think when I laughed, I made the person feel even more ridiculous. Yeah. You know, at, at, at times I returned kind and kind because there was a time when honky was um, a, a, a chosen expression, a chosen derogatory term for white people. And so I, I retaliated by calling the person a honky. And so we had a little name calling and that was that. But um, that was when I was much younger, and yeah. um, the, 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 the tools at my disposal were not as varied and as effective as they are now. Um, so now, in all likelihood, I may, if I think it's worth it, I may take the time to educate the person, or at least to try, or simply ignore the person completely. Yeah, um, which sometimes could be more effective than engaging with the person. Um, I remember, I mean, I, I think on one occasion I might have gotten into a physical fight. I can't remember, but it it it, it all depends. If I think it's worth my time and energy, I'll engage. If not, I simply go my way. Yeah, so basically, for you, stereotypes neither here nor there you just keep it moving like you you do what you have to do to advance but yes that's uh, that's the bottom line because um I, I, again it's a matter of okay what's at stake here what do i want out of this i am how does how does this affect me going forward and mm -hmm. um, so I might internalize it at the time, and uh, I may deal with it later on. But um, yeah, it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of choices and priorities. Hmm. So, because um, yeah, I actually I wanted to the way I the the idea I had in mind was discussing basically your where you're from, a bit about your background, your history. Uh, your experiences with diversity and inclusion in Canada, how you deal with stereotypes. So sort of build up to why 
we should not necessarily, we, who's we? Why these messages with respect to whether a person is a minority or the person's age should not necessarily sink in or should not prevent anyone from participating or adapting to to technology. And the reason I thought of this conversation is that when I did the Bitcoin episode with Ashley of Bitcoin Wisdom for Busy People, I got feedback saying basically, you know, like, I, I, to summarize, you know, black people of a certain age probably will never get on the Bitcoin bandwagon. And I know that this is not the case for you, for example. So I wanted to just do a little illustration about your backstory to actually speak about your thoughts on money and Bitcoin. Because I think that this is quite fascinating. And I think that um, it would be helpful for certain people to hear your perspective on these things. Um, so, how did you learn about money and the importance of saving? How did I learn? Wow. Um, I, may, I might have to go back to my childhood. And uh, I'll, I'll tell the story as briefly as I can, uh, but still make it interesting. So now, as a child, um, it, it, we, we were poor, but not poor. I mean, we had a lot of land, um, we were agricultural people, believed in education. My childhood was um, tough in some cases. I had to work very hard, wake up early in the morning, sometimes earlier than most children, I had to do chores, all that sort of thing. Now, we engaged also in something called, at the time, animal husbandry. Uh, that included uh, keeping livestock, uh, pigs, goats, chicken, turkeys, ducks, you name it. And, um, you know, there's something about hens, they lay eggs. And um, eggs are a form of food. And in our town, Princess Town, where I grew up, uh, we had, um, let's say, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, we didn't call them that then, we had entrepreneurs who had little, um, here we would call them convenience stores, but we call them parlors for whatever reason. So now these entrepreneurs sold, you know, various things. Among those things were eggs. And I discovered somewhere along the line that um, sometimes when the hens laid the eggs, my uncle with whom I grew at the time and a gra foster grandfather didn't know. So I stole some of those eggs when I sold them to some of <gasps> You the did not steal. Uh, yes, I did. Sold them to some <laughs> of the entrepreneurs who didn't mind buying them and selling them at a profit. So that's, I think that was my first. And then uh, later on, as, as I grew older, um, it, when we went, when we harvested produce, I was given a portion to take to the marketplace to sell, and out of that I would get some money as well, and that continued. It, okay, later on I became a, a, what was called a, a pupil teacher, so I didn't have to do that anymore. When I arrived in Toronto and I began, when I recorded my first album, which was called Culture Shock. I am. I got on the streets, especially during the Caravana Parade, and I peddled my uh, vinyl, my 33 RPM vinyl, myself. I didn't wait on a record store or someone to sell them for me. So this sense of money and entrepreneurship has been with me for, from, from very, very early. Uh, my curiosity about life and how things come to be have has taken me in many directions. One of the directions is how money is is created. Learning about the history of money, I am from way back. You know whether they were cowrie shells, whether they be, it became gold later on, and how lending money and creating money came into being. Fiat currency, it led me to understand fiat currency and um, the whole thing about, okay, the 1929 stock market crash, the Bretton Woods and um, America getting off the gold standard with Nixon in 71, uh, the meeting at Jekyll Island, you name it, um, the, the history of the Rothschilds family 
and on and on and on and on. And uh, it, when we, for instance, um, uh, uh, bought our first, first home, I didn't quite understand um, as much about money. When we bought a second home, and I really looked into it, I said, damn, but uh, no bank actually puts the cold hard cash. Let's say you have to borrow a quarter of a million, a half a million dollars. No bank puts a quarter or half a million dollars into your account in cold cash and say, here's the money. You get on a computer screen, you made an, make an agreement, bang, 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 you agree on it, this is the amount, and just like that, money is created, just like magic, fiat mm -hmm. currency. So now, when Bitcoin came on the scene, I, I became curious, and I've been curious about computers, I became curious, I said, what the hell is this? And I started looking into it, and I thought, hmm, this is interesting, but Honestly, I did not understand it. I was curious. I didn't understand. And I started delving into it. Then I I just left it alone. Yeah. And then, then I went back later on. I looked at it again. I thought, well, let me put a few dollars in this and see. What... Honestly, I should have been a blockchain, a Bitcoin, a million years several times over by now. Because at that time... Uh, um, Satoshi was worth, or a coin was worth, oh my God, a few cents. So yeah. anyway, I left it. I even forgot my password, my Bitcoin password, and I thought, oh my gosh. And then when it took off again, when was it, 2017 or something like that? That's why when I went back into it. So this thing about black people and black people of a certain age um, not being interested in in cryptocurrency um, is a fallacy and it would be um, stereotyping at its worst because um, I mean I was into blockchain and Bitcoin even before you were you know, you know so and when I, I when I say you I not necessarily you individually but you as representative of a demographic group you know I am, so before many young people even knew about Bitcoin, even heard about Bitcoin or blockchain, I was into it, you know. So that belies this um, thinking that black people of a certain age would not be into cryptocurrency or would not appreciate Bitcoin. And really and truly, I, am, I, I can see why institutions, uh, financial institutions, and um, the heads of these institutions would uh, decry Bitcoin and try to convince people not to get involved because it's a direct threat to their existence. Yeah. Yep, yep, definitely. Definitely, definitely. So I guess all in all, in summary, <laughs> don't let stereotypes prevent you from doing anything in life. And you are or you are living proof of this. That's been one of my guiding principles. As a matter of fact, a major guiding principle. I am, it, as human beings, I think if, if, we, if we are functioning as effectively as we should be, we, we are responding to external and external internal internal stimuli yeah. um, at least that, that's what I'm conscious of and at different times in our lives the external might be greater than the internal but I think at all times if we if we are to accomplish we should be driven by the internal for different people that would take them in different directions it would have different limitations but um, I, I believe that it's important. Most of the people, well, I would say all the, the, the people who have accomplished anything of significance were driven by internal stimuli. Oh, definitely. You know, and, and this, again, brings us back to mythology. In, in any instance, whether it's a, a, a hero or heroine, um, the call comes. And that call is very often an internal something. So maybe rather than say an internal stimuli, maybe a better term might be uh, an internal um, arousing, you know, uh, uh, an internal awareness that now prods this person to respond sometimes unknowingly 
um, to, to finding the solution to a problem or taking up a challenge which, which at the time might not even be discernible to most people but, but the person receives the call in whatever way that happens I cannot um, define that uh, because whether one chooses to say it's a call from God, uh, from the Great Spirit, from you know the universe, however one chooses to put it, but the person uh, has an impulse, and the person now either accepts or rejects because not everyone responds to the call. But the people who accomplish anything of significance, and, and, and even, I mean, people who accomplish things that might not be as significant, they respond to something, they're, they're driven from the inside, and uh, they interact with the environment around them, and so at least try to bring about change. In many cases, they do bring about change. I am so grateful to my father for joining me in this episode. You know, when I was a kid, I had a tough time wrapping my head around my father's philosophical approach to life. I mean, I just couldn't figure out how to apply Greek mythology to the challenges I faced as an eight-year-old. I'm smiling now, but at the time, trust me, it was frustrating. <laughs> but. Today, as an adult, I'm grateful. I'm lucky because my father has shown me that when we're on the receiving end of negative stereotypes, although very painful at times to manage, we're susceptible to hurting ourselves even more if we internalize those negative stereotypes. And we all have a tendency to project stereotypes or make assumptions, positive or negative, about others. If you'd like to practice challenging your assumptions, here's a little exercise that I do. And of course I do this in real life and not on social media. When you encounter someone, pay attention to your immediate thoughts or judgment about them. Try not to censor or judge yourself. Then look for three qualities that disprove your assumptions. With practice, this will feel more natural and it'll actually help you with countering unconscious bias. So there we have it, the end of the episode. Thank you again for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, contact me at Saida at fosterinclusion.com. That's S-A-I-D-A-H at F-O-S-T-E-R-I-N-C-L-U s-i-o-n dot com and visit the website www.fosterinclusion.com Bye!